Saw people coming in this morning, a little extra pep in their step, some smiles. Could be because the weather is beautiful. Could be because you noticed my Facebook post this week that <laughs> promised that I wouldn't preach for an hour. So both of those things are true this week. So we can enjoy, we can be stress-free. There are many things in the church that over time have become taboo. They're considered tacky. They're considered unappealing to talk about in the church. And fortunately for me, this morning I have the pleasure of diving into two of those topics head first. Our passage this morning is in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 25. As we re-enter our, our series of rethinking the church this morning, we have an opportunity to reconsider how we can care for the church by caring for its elders. Our passage this morning has to do with not only money, but with caring for pastors well. There's this perception when it comes to money in the church that pastors are trying to manipulate the church into brand new building projects, or pastors are asking for higher salaries, that they're being ungrateful for what they're being given. And honestly, there's a reason that this perception exists. It's because the church has been abused. The church has been manipulated in the past. And so it makes sense that this thought process is here. But just because it's taboo, just because there have been abuses in the past, that isn't an excuse for us to dig into the scripture and take what it gives us. And this morning, it's what it gives us. Because how churches care for elders, both financially and otherwise, tells us something about the heart of the church. And that is what Paul is getting at into the text this morning. So we, as we look at each sermon, as we've been moving through rethinking the church in 1 Timothy, as we look through a series week by week in a book of the Bible, uh, there's a need for us to focus in on the narrow, on the pages and the verses of the passage that we're reading, but there's also a need for us to take a step back and have a big picture look at the book itself. So it could seem that in 1 Timothy chapters 3 through 6 that we've been working through, that Paul is dealing with random and disconnected issues. But the themes actually fit together perfectly. Paul uses uh, chapter 3 verses 14 through 16 to establish this framework of a church that has a confession of the gospel. And everything that follows builds upon this confession. We learn about identifying church leaders, the pastors, the elders, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Then we learn how to train one another for godliness in chapter 4, verse 8. We learn about honoring and respecting our fellow brothers and sisters, other believers, in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And then we learn about how we need to support widows in our communities in chapter 5, verse 3. The background theme throughout all of these different issues is one center theme. The gospel should be on display in the church. The gospel looks differently than the world looks. There are unbelievers that are overcome by the issues of the world. When fear and anxiety and hopelessness run rampant, the gospel provides us a different reality. Ephesians tells us that we are to live differently, and that's what the gospel unlocks for us is this different life. And so as we read 1 Timothy and connect how all of these things work together as a true united gospel theme, he wants us to consider the truths. And in this passage this morning, Chapter 5, verses 17 through 25, he wants us to consider the question, what does leadership look like in the church? Chapter 5 begins by displaying that the church's care for the world and care for widows sets it apart from the world. Now in the second portion of chapter 5, we are taught that the relationship between church leaders and the congregation, church membership, also looks different. In the church, the gospel should be on full display. The contrast between leadership 
and those that they are leading in the secular world and in the church is not a difficult illustration. In the secular world, gossip, favoritism, suspicion, harsh leadership, strain, and a constant battle to get on the top is all expected. But that is not a normal atmosphere in the church. The house of God looks different. The church looks different. Leaders in the church, we have a genuine concern for the members of the church. And the congregation has a genuine and loving esteem for its elders. It is mutual. We are together. We are one church under the headship of Christ. The atmosphere is important. This is a quote by David Platt. This different atmosphere that the church has versus the secular world is important because God intends for unbelievers to look at the church and see the glory of God expressed as the gospel of God impacts the people of God. And so this morning, we learn that we as a church display the gospel by honoring, protecting, rebuking, and appointing its elders. And so hopefully at this time, you've had a moment to turn to our passage. We're in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 25, and it reads, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that, they, so that the rest may stand in fear. And in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing with partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we are thankful for an opportunity to come together to learn that how better we as a church can display your gospel to the people around us. We pray that we would be a people that are impassioned and desire to pursue this gospel and that we would bring this gospel to the community around us and to the world around us, Lord. We pray that you would allow us to read your text and see the way that you are shining light on Christ in every word. Pray that this morning that you would allow the gospel to be clear and that you would allow any faults that I have or any places that I fall short to be uh, put on the back and instead that your gospel would be proclaimed clearly and that people would respond to it. We love you and we're thankful for you. And in your name we pray, amen. Okay, so this morning... I believe the first thing that we should do is define terms in this text. Because twice in verses, uh, in the first three verses, sorry, of our passage, we see reference made to elders. The Greek word that we're dealing with for elders here is presbyteros, which is defined as old man. But when we consider context with this word, we actually see that what uh, is happening here is it's referring back to Titus 1, 5 through 9, which functions as a list of qualifications for elders. Or we can look to 1 Timothy or Ephesians to see that they're shepherds. Or we can look to uh, 1 Timothy 3 to see that they're overseers. These three words, elders, shepherds, and overseers, they run together. They're synonyms. They're interchangeable. They are all referring to one role, an office in the church, that of elder or pastor. Pastor Jeff and I are who function as these roles in this church. We also see it used in Acts 20 where Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders. He's talking to the elders, the pastors of the Ephesian church. So this morning when we read the word elder, and you hear me talk about elders and pastors, I'm referring to the same people. This is important because this text, 1 Timothy as a book, has interacted with elderly people. 
and now it's interacting with elders of the church. And so that's why it's important for us to make this distinction. Because in our passage, Paul is not just communicating that the congregation care for its elders, but also that the elders were responsible and accountable to the congregation. He is talking about your pastors. Okay, so our first, our first point this morning is that we take care of our church by honoring its elders. Paul gives his first instruction in verse 17. He says, let the elders who rule well be considered of double honor. This term double honor is argued. Uh, many of the commentaries I read say slightly different things. There are a lot of people that refer or think that it's referring to several different options, but as I read it, as I study, it seems pretty obvious to me exactly what he's talking about. First, double honor refers to respect. When Paul starts the very next passage in chapter 6, he says, let all who are under a yoke as bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. And clearly, you are not Pastor Jeff and I's bondservants. You are not our slaves. But what's happening here is, is Paul is trying to get us at a, an idea. He wants us to imagine this gratitude, this appreciation. That's the, that's the feeling that he wants in our hearts as we think of double honoring our elders. This theme and this concept are also written by, by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, where he requests that the church recognize those who labor and lead. So double honor, the first is respect. The second portion of this double honor is concerning wages or compensation. Now people would argue that it is outrageous that this speak about compensation. They would ask, where do you see this? How can this be possible? Uh, it seems very obvious to me because in verse 18, if you look, it says the word for which is him giving the basis for what he has just said in verse 17 concerning double honoring elders. It says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer deserves his wages. Paul is clearly referring to the compensation of pastors, to paying those who have devoted themselves to full time and sometime to part time ministry. What Paul is doing, however, is not being precise. He's not giving us a prescription. He's not saying the pastor, the elder should pay, be paid this much in every church. This is the number. He's not giving us that because it is different across the board, right? You have pastors that have families of seven and pastors that have families of two. And you have pastors that were pastors for 40 plus years and pastors who have been pastors for seven months, right? It's different across the board. Some pastors, like Paul, were bivocational, right? He decided he didn't want to take anything from the church, so instead he was going to work for his living. He didn't want the church to give him money. There are pastors today that are in that spot. They are in a position where they can continue to provide for their family and care for their family, and they don't have to take money from the church. That's a dream. That would be excellent. That is what all pastors want. We also have pastors that go to churches with 150 people and pastor them. We also have pastors that are pastoring churches of 10,000. Every pastor is in a different spot. And so this compensation is not precise. He's not giving us a number or a quantity to give the pastors. What he is saying is be generous. Be kind to the pastors. I also believe that Paul didn't believe that the pastor should be the highest paid individual in the church. When Paul refers to double honor, it feels very unlikely he was referring to providing the pastor with an extravagant financial compensation. And actually in the opposite, he will warn us against the desire for being rich throughout the entire text of chapter 6. I would argue, though, again, that double, double honor indicates that God's people should give generously to their pastors. And this is something that I think our church does well. I feel cared for. Pastor Jeff feels cared for. Pastor Wright felt cared for. You do this well. 
but it's not as common as you think it may be to do this well. When I was preparing to step into full-time ministry, I was warned for years and years and years about how little money I was going to make. People over and over again prepared me for being very, very poor, living below the line of poverty with my family. I have heard from people genuinely a sentiment of, Lord, you keep him humble, and Lord, we will keep him poor. I have friends today. It is a little funny, but it's also terrible. We have, I have friends today that make less than they should make. I have friends today that are burdened by their load as a pastor because they cannot provide for their families, and they are working more than 40-hour weeks. And I would argue that this, this practice of, Lord, you keep him humble, we will keep him poor, violates verse 18. It goes exactly against what Paul is telling us. He's calling for a basic sense of fairness when it comes to considering compensation. Paul goes as far, he pulls this, this trump card out, and he quotes Jesus. He says, the laborer deserves his wages. That's from Luke 10. It's from Matthew And then he also goes back to the Old Testament and he quotes Deuteronomy 25.4 which says you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. See an ox is able to eat as it works. What he's saying is the same should be expected for pastors. When a church does not compensate a pastor well it communicates to the congregation and to the outside world that looks on how little they value the ministry of the Word of God and how much they value their own money and their own possessions. Like always, when the Bible interacts with money, it is not in the sense of dollars and quantities. It's talking about what is at the heart of the situation. If a church does not care for their pastors well, what does that say about their hearts? And so now we know that double honor includes respect and it includes compensation. And now we can divide and dive into the fact that this honor is not automatic. A pastor is not entitled to this double honor. Paul provides us with two conditions for this double honor. The first is that they must be good leaders or rule well in the church. You see that in verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Paul's not only referring to a pastor leading well through administration and management, which is the idea behind the words leader that's used three times in chapter 3 when talking about elders, the qualifications, they must manage their families, they must lead their families well. The idea behind this is administration. It is managing your family, which is a part of eldership. But I believe that he's also inciting John 10, which talks about a good shepherd, a leader who loves well, who cares, who sacrifices, and who is ultimately willing to lay down their lives in order to protect their sheep. So that's not an excuse for me to not work on my administration and my organization. It is a part of this job. Right? We are planning events, we're planning sermons, we're hoping to minister to our communities and to our people here at the church. We have to have events, we have to plan ministries, organization is a big part of that. But the big part is how well do they care and love for the congregation. The bigger question that's being asked is, is this man being faithful? Is he doing what he's supposed to be doing? Is he caring for the congregation? And so the second condition for receiving this double honor is that they must labor in preaching and teaching. This is the this labor word is the same word that we saw in chapter four when it talked about toiling. And we dealt with there the toil, the image of toiling and laboring, it's strenuous, it's putting out immense effort, it is going the furthest mile to reach this thing. This is giving us the same image. The pastor should be toiling and laboring with the text. We need to be preparing to teach and to preach and to lead. It doesn't necessarily mean that I need to be reading my Bible 24-7 and always preparing to teach and preach. 
but it does mean that a large amount of my time during the week goes to me reading, me praying, me doing my spiritual disciplines, and then preparing to teach and preach and lead by example for you. This word in verse 17 especially is important because it can also be translated, that is. And so it would, it would read that the, the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, that is, those who labor in preaching and teaching. A pastor who labors over his preaching and teaching, who spends time in prayer and in the word of God, is doing the work that deserves double honor. Our second instruction this morning for caring for the church, by caring for elders, is found in verse 19, and it is to protect elders. Verse 19 reads, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As a church, we display the gospel by caring for the church. And we care for the church by caring for our elders, by caring for our pastors. One of the ways that we care for the pastors is by protecting them. In verse 19, he gives his second instruction, do not admit a charge against an elder. The very need for this instruction from Paul should give us all the warning that we need to know that there will come times where we have to protect the pastors. No word, no verse in the Bible is accidental. And so if he's giving us this instruction, if he's giving us this warning, it is because we need to hear it. It's because we will face it. The nature of pastoral work places pastors in numerous sin-filled and difficult situations that demand a firm commitment and faith to the Word of God. And because of this, pastors are frequently the target of accusation, more so than most other members of the congregation. And so Paul is issuing to us a piece of advice because the frequency of accusations that come against elders, we should be cautious when an elder is accused. Based on the biblical principle from Deuteronomy, we see that we should dismiss, dismiss any accusations that do not include two or three or more eyewitnesses. Now I want to take a step back. Because I am not implying, and neither is Paul implying, that in the world that we live in right now, that we should ignore and put to the side serious allegations against pastors. We should not. And the good news is, as you read through this text, he gives us this to put some allegations to the side, and then he immediately gives us verses 20 through 21 that are all about rebuking the pastor that will handle when a pastor comes against a serious allegation, how we should go about it. Today, pastors all over the world, some famous, some very wealthy, and some that none of us have ever heard of, are always pulled out of ministry because they have fallen morally. And it is right that they be taken out of ministry. And so Paul does not want us to protect our pastors when they are not fulfilling the qualifications that come before them. But he does want us to handle all of these accusations with the highest level of care and consideration. The reason that this text focuses on the pastor is because of the public nature of this position. Right now, I am here with you, but I'm also talking to the people in the gym, and we're streaming on YouTube so that anybody in the whole world can watch our sermon. It is a very public position. The same way that a pastor being accused of wrongdoing and it being true is a stain on the church to onlookers, so too would it be if he was accused and destroyed and these allegations and accusations turned out to be unfounded. We learn in 1 Timothy 3.15, that the church is a pillar of truth. So now we must do whatever we can to protect the reputation of those who preach and teach this truth in the church. We need to be a church that is ready and willing, willing to field accusations and allegations that come against our pastors. 
We need to be patient in our observation and investigation. And we need to be eager to eliminate the unfounded and sorrowful, sorrowful to eliminate that that is true. We need to put an end to unhelpful and ungodly criticism that comes against the pastors. Ungodly and unhelpful criticism, it brings down the reputation of those who labor in the ministry of the word. We as a church also do a very good job of this. You'll notice that uh, at the beginning of this year, Pastor Jeff came up and shared with you some changes to the Constitution. And one of them was that if there are people in the church that are coming against our pastors and they're holding secret meetings and they are going against them and slandering them, there is discipline involved with that. Our church does a good job of this. Right? I know, especially our secretaries in the office, right? people are comfortable with them, they share things with them. Some of it does not need to reach the pastors. Some of it does. You and the church do a good job of fielding this. We are protected. We feel loved and cared for by you. And then we get into verses 20 and 21. We are shifting from this protecting of elders into what it looks like to come to our elders and rebuke them. Because there are unfortunately many accusations and allegations that come forward that do hold credible evidence from two or three or more witnesses. And when they do, Paul exhorts us in this way. He says, as for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. This is public rebuke. This is public discipline. And this public rebuke is not only a part of biblical discipline, but it is for the purpose of causing both the elder and the congregation to fear the consequences of sin. Because we should be afraid of our sin. We should be afraid of not only our capacity and willingness and sometimes eagerness to sin, but we should be afraid of the fact that our sin drives a wedge between us and the Heavenly Father. When we're interacting with this public rebuking, I don't believe that Paul, in this scenario, has in mind every single sin that an elder may commit. For instance, if I were to leave this morning after preaching and walk across the street in front of our church to the high school, I would be jaywalking. I don't believe that Paul believes that I should be publicly rebuked by the church for my jaywalking. <laughs> Don't think that's what he had in mind. I think that this portion of our text actually directly should be considered next to the verses that come earlier in 1 Timothy in chapter 3. Because in chapter 3 we have a list of qualifications for someone to step into the position of an overseer or a shepherd or an elder or a pastor. These men, they must be above reproach. They must be the husbands of one wife. They must be sober-minded. They must be self-controlled. They must be respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, which is important in the verse to come. They must be gentle. They must not be a lover of money, which is important to consider when talking about how we should generously pay our pastors. They shouldn't be greedy. We should not love money too much. They must manage or lead their households well, keeping their children. They mustn't be a new convert. They should have experience. They should have years of believing in Christ and signs of fruit and spiritual growth. They can't have too big of an ego. Their pride needs to be in check. They must have a good reputation. It would make sense that if this long list of qualifications for elders was being uh, challenged, that if our pastors are sinning in a way that is getting in the, in the way of this uh, list of qualifications, that we should pay attention, that we as a church should look upon and know that they are breaking these qualifications. It is, however, very important to notice that if we don't, we don't have a, the same way he doesn't give us a precise number 
a prescription for how much we should pay pastors. He does not give us a precise sin or a prescription for when this public rebuke comes into play. And so that means that it is up to church leadership. It is up to the congregation to make these very difficult and hard decisions as they pray faithfully. As they read their, the, God's word faithfully. It comes down to you to rebuke the pastor. As for those who persist in sin, they are the ones that are, uh, who deserve rebuking in the presence of all. This means that there is a habit of unrepentant sin. We have a leader in the church who refuses to repent in the eyes of the congregation for a sin that they are committing. They are persisting in sin. Now our tendency as a church, as people of God, is to realize and notice the stain that this could have on the church, and so we decide to move along quietly to dismiss this man, to move along with efficiency so that we don't disrupt anything in the church or any ministries that are going on. And for some scenarios, this may be appropriate, but this morning, that is not what Paul is talking about. He is exhorting us to a very public setting that this leader is supposed to be rebuked in. This is in the presence of all. And I believe that this is really important, that it be this public, and I believe that for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that the unrepentant elder or pastor, need, the first reason they need to be rebuked publicly is because we as members of the church need to stand as witnesses to the truth. We as the church, need to display the gospel. Again, in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church, we, the church, are the pillars and the foundation of truth. That means that we are proclaimers. It means that we are an example of the gospel to the world around us. We align ourselves with Christ. And when we do that, we align ourselves with His justice and His judgment that's to come. Paul is exhorting the church to make sure that they did not deny their identity in Christ. They were not to up, fail to uphold the truth of the gospel. Even though public rebuke is difficult. Even though when a pastor and an elder fall, it is difficult. It will be difficult, and it is painful, but still today, it is what is right. And oftentimes, we tell this to the youth group all the time, oftentimes what is right in our lives is what is the most difficult. So we have to be willing to sacrifice the things around us in order to do what is right. And what is right will best display the gospel to onlookers as they look to the church. So as people look at the church and we publicly rebuke an elder for their falling, what it does is better display the gospel of Jesus Christ to that onlooker, to that unbeliever, than if we were to dismiss them quietly and pretend as though it never happened. Because what they did was a stain on the gospel. And for that, there are consequences. And those consequences... In biblical discipline, based on this text, means that they are rebuked publicly. And it also serves as a warning to others as they look on. The Bible motivates us in many different ways. Oftentimes it refers by referring to and pointing to God's grace, is how we are motivated to do what it is instructing us. But what's happening here is a little different. Paul wanted other elders, and God wants us now as pastors to look upon what is happening in the world around us as pastors fall morally, and they want us to be full of sorrow. And they want us to look upon it and say, may it never be me. May it never happen to this church. We don't want this. We want to fight for the gospel 
The only way to avoid falling into this, because we've already talked about our capacity and our willingness and sometimes our decisions to go and pursue sin, the only way to recognize and to fight against this, because we are all capable, is through prayer. It's through frequent time spent with God. That is what Paul is teaching us. We do this, we spend time in prayer, we spend time reading God's word, we spend time, unfortunately, sometimes publicly rebuking elders in front of the world because we are the pillar of truth. And so in order to best display the gospel of Jesus Christ in our church, it means that sometimes public rebuke is necessary. So as we come up to the last three verses of our passage this morning, we, we work through our last portion of how we care for the church well by caring for its pastors. And it is appointing elders. This last instruction given to us by Paul is to appoint our pastors with great care. He writes, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. He seems here to be connecting that if someone is made an elder too quickly, it correlates directly with our own guilt. Right? The reason that when you, when you hire a pastor or call a pastor at this church, there is an interview process. Right? Before we ever meet, I filled out a questionnaire. And then I came and met with a small, small group, a search committee. And then after that search committee, I met with a, the deacons, the leadership of the church. And after that, I came before you and I preached in Hebrews. And then I had to stand and answer your questions. And then I had to go and meet with the youth group and lead them and share with them. And Carolyn was a part of this whole process. It was long. It took several months and the reason we did that carefully is because if you were to call the wrong man because you were too quick and you had too much haste, it reflects your own guilt, just as much his. In verse 23, Paul gives the instruction that confuses and uh, uh, causes fret for so many readers when he, he writes, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Uh, I don't think we have to fret when we read this text. think that what Paul is telling Timothy is not exactly, uh, to drink is not what's being communicated to us just as we read it on the page. You can remember that in 1 Timothy 3, when we talked through the qualifications of an elder, it says not to be a drunkard. And so it wouldn't make any sense for Paul to now be telling Timothy, like, hey, don't persist in sin. Make sure you keep yourself pure, but you can definitely drink some. That's not what's happening. It's not what's being communicated. What it would appear to me is that Timothy has some sort of, he has a health issue. There is something wrong with Timothy's health. And for their time, in the first century, in Ephesus, this alcohol, this wine, is serving some sort of medicinal function for him. And we're not talking about medicine for a long, hard day at work. It's more serious than this. It's serious enough that it is necessary for Timothy to drink some alcohol. On top of this, Paul's building off of verse 22, where he tells Timothy to make sure that he is staying pure when they appoint elders, right? T Paul is talking about stay pure from the sins of other men. And he doesn't want Timothy to interpret him saying, stay pure as though, okay, well, I have to stay pure. Even though I have stomach issues, that means I can't be drinking any alcohol. I have to stay pure, no more alcohol. And then he starts to get sick again. It's almost when you write an email and you're communicating a point in the email and then because of that point you're like, oh, is this a distraction or does this confuse earlier? And so you put things in parentheses. That's what's happening in verse 23. He's telling Timothy, stay pure. Don't fall into the sins of others. But then he's saying, but you, have, you can take your medicine. 
You have health issues. You need this for you to function in your daily life. That's what's happening. Verse 23 functions as a, oh yeah, like by the way, you don't have to do this. So then as he moves into verse 24 and 25, Paul, he returns to instructions in verse 22. Not to lay hands on anyone, which means to appoint them as an elder too quickly. What is communicated here in verse 24 is that some men should not be recognized as elders in the congregation because their sins are obvious and their sins are immediate. But some men should also not be appointed by the congregation as elders because their sins are more difficult to locate. Their sins are uh, covered by good works and they will only show up later. Now once again, what Paul is not communicating to us is that it's not okay to make mistakes and that churches have to be perfect in who they appoint. As we look at churches who have had pastors fail morally, we do not point our finger at them. Their pastor made terrible choices. Their pastor disqualified himself from ministry. The church did not disqualify him. We do not have to be perfect. And thank goodness. What he is saying is that it's okay to take your time. Being diligent in your choosing is wise. We've already interacted with 1 Timothy chapter 3 a lot, which includes this long list of qualifications for pastors. That list is long for a reason. Your elders, your pastors, there are high standards for those men. There are many qualifications that they must meet so that not every man can be an elder. Not every man can be a pastor. And because that list is long, it should not be addressed quickly. It should not be interacted with with haste. Instead, we should take our time. And we should carefully make sure that our pastors meet these qualifications that are established in 1 Timothy 3. One of the biggest dangers the church faces when appointing elders is indifference. The people of the church, the congregation, you are busy. And it seems like your life has plenty of issues without having to put on top of it the responsibility of electing a pastor or appointing an elder. But this Responsibility, it's far from unimportant because it's a gospel activity. In Acts, it says that the church was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are the church, which means, praise God, we were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. And now the church and its people, we are important to God. And so 1 Timothy 3 teaches us that God wants us in His glory and His gospel to be displayed in the church. We see that we as a church display the gospel by honoring, protecting, rebuking, and appointing elders. And so when we don't take heed of what Paul is exhorting us to in 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 25, we come dangerously close to undermining God's design for the church. That design is to advance the gospel and in that way glorify him. This passage was not written so that pastors would have fat wallets and magnificent homes. It also wasn't written so that congregations would frequently publicly rebuke their elders for their shortcomings. It was written, though, so that the church might display the glory of God and display the truth of His gospel. To see, God receives this glory when we, the church, display this gospel. This passage reminds us of the kindness and graciousness of the gospel of Jesus. How do we avoid things in the church like gossip and allegations? How do we create a reality that includes unity and forgiveness? How do we honor our pastors and our churches? How do we hold them to such a high standard? The only way that we can do that is through the gospel. 
The elders and the pastors of the church need the gospel to save them from greed and entitlement and impurity and laziness and many more. And the congregation needs the gospel to protect them from unfair criticism and a spirit of disunity and from gossip. And that means that we and you and all of us need the gospel. That's what it means. The congregation, the pastors, we all need the gospel. And only through this gospel of Jesus Christ and by the grace and love of God can we care for our church well. And when we care for our church well, we're doing gospel work. Gospel that saves us from an eternity in hell and allows us to walk beside our Savior, allows us to now care for our church well. And in doing so, we display this gospel for unbelievers that look upon us. And this is the gospel, that message, that Paul is presenting to us in the book of 1 Timothy. So let us as a church continue to heed and and appoint to this gospel message and let us in that way serve God as well. If you would pray with me this morning. Lord, we are... so blessed to be a part of your church, to be a part of your family, and we're so grateful to have been adopted into this family. I pray that you allow us as pastors to follow your word closely and faithfully. I pray that you let us as the church, as members, as the congregation, to protect our pastors, but also to be willing to rebuke them when the time is is necessary. I pray that you protect this church from the need of rebuking, Lord. But I pray that above all that you allow us to be a pillar of truth for you, that you allow us to display your gospel in, in every way possible. We pray that this morning, that if there are people in the room that feel a stirring, that feel this need to respond to your gospel and how it saves all of us because of our sin, I pray that you would allow them to be bold enough to respond, Lord. We love you so much. And in your name we pray. Amen.